So when you were in Canada, you were uh, working on um, John Kavanagh's YouTube channel, right? Actually, not John Kavanagh's, because uh, the way it is, it's kind of a complicated structure that I got myself into, because SBG, Straight Blast Gym, is an international... Is that... Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Go for it. It's an international... Um, how do you call that? Organization? Mm -hmm. And when I was in Portland, I was also in, at an SBG, which is run by the founder of SBG, uh, Matt Thornton. And we became friends, and also he started asking me for help when he does camps. That's how I met John Kavanagh through Matt Thornton, because Matt Thornton is the coach of John Kavanagh. But uh, when I went to Canada, it was basically for Matt Thornton. And uh -huh. I left John Kavanagh here. So it's kind uh -huh. of a complicated, <laughs> messy thing. You cheated yeah. on John Gavina. Yeah. Oh <laughs> Welcome to the Hombu Dojo podcast, folks. We're talking about infidelity in the MMA scene. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when you step over the line. <laughs> We're talking to Rokas. How do you say your second name? It's terrible. Uh, I'll, I'll say it, but it's Leonavichus. Leonavichus. That is not what that it says on Instagram. very good. <laughs> You're from Lithuania, yeah? Yes. We have our own Lithuanian instructor. Yeah. Aldous yeah. Janoszewskis. So nice, I, practice, I got yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the uh, Rokas, you might know folks as the uh, the martial arts journey guy on YouTube. Uh, that's well, that's the name of his YouTube channel, Martial Arts Journey. You used to be, I don't know, the Aikido guy. Yes, I kind of went from this guy to that guy. <laughs> uh, initially, it was the Aikido guy because I was full head into Aikido. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? There's already loads of stuff out there online about your journey, you know, and your kind of big switch from traditional martial arts mm. to MMA and stuff like that. So I don't think we're going to dwell too much on that today. I just want to chat to you as a guy mm -hmm. who's doing martial arts full time and uh, also doing martial arts full time in Dublin, just like us. How do you like Dublin? I like Dublin. Uh, when I arrived here, I was from the very first moment I got the impression that it's it's a big city, but it doesn't feel like a big city, which is what I like. Uh, usually I'm not a fan of big cities, especially living in them, but Dublin had that sense of kind of a, more or less of a small, cozy town. Depends on where you are at, at which moment and, and so on, but, but it has a nice kind of warm enough feeling. Uh, and also I like Dubliners, like Irish people. Yeah. Uh, I like authenticity and kind of when someone is natural and there's no sense of, Big cities oftentimes have people who are fake. It's all, yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's all yeah. about them. You, it's very transactional. Is that the right word? Sure, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Talking to them, they, Good point, yeah. they, they talk to you as if, only if they need something from you. Right. And I didn't really get that sense from Dublin. So what you're saying is Dublin's the best city in the world. <laughs> One of those, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I see, I see. No, cool, cool, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find the same. I'm, I'm from Scotland originally, so I moved here five years ago. Mm. It's the same thing, like it is that sort of big city, small city vibe, though. Yeah, you know? and uh, like I live in Ranala, and you've got everything on your doorstep in this area here, and then you've got like the rest of the city to explore. Like, I've still, there's still places in the city that are really well known, really famous. Like, five years I've still not been there, really? you know? Yeah, yeah, like where? Like, oh, you know, the place, <laughs> <laughs> lots of places, you know? Yeah, I suppose. Uh, no, I've been everywhere, man. I haven't seen the north side too much. I'm told, don't go there. I, <laughs> there's less on the north side, to be honest. Shit, know, people are going to be listening. We're going to get messages about this. <laughs> but there is obviously a lot more money on the south side. Everybody knows that. There's an economic divide. But because of that, there's less reason to go to the north side than if you want to eat out or if you want to yeah. go to some kind of fashionable nightclub or something like that. I think I've just turned into a bit of a snob. You have? What, is, yeah. what would they say back home about that? Oh, uh, go through me. They just call you a wee ball bag. That's <laughs> it, um, So why did you choose Dublin? Come and drink. Um, again, it's... My, my life spins in very fast ways. Uh, it was supposed to be initially coming back to Portland because I lived in Portland for six months. Then I went back for a couple of months to Lithuania, my home country. And the plan was go back to Portland, get employed, train full time, et cetera, et cetera. But I met John Kavanagh, and I visited him on my way to Lithuania. I spent 10 days with him filming stuff for him. And the next, the second day, he asked me, so why Portland? Why not Dublin? I was like, what do you mean? And then he offered me an opportunity to come for a few months, train, him, train with him, and film stuff for him as an exchange. And uh, I thought, well, if I want to learn MMA, 
John Kavanaugh sounds pretty cool. So we've never met the guy, but obviously yeah. he's probably most famous for being Conor McGregor's co coach. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. what's he like? Uh, He'll probably never listen to this, by the way. So be completely <laughs> yeah, be honest. honest. Yeah. No, I can be. I can be completely honest. Uh, John Kavanaugh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not Conor McGregor. Have you met him? I uh, met Conor a few times, uh, but not like you know on a personal level. Sure, sure. So just, just briefly, right? Just kind of yeah, mm. being in the same space. Cool, cool. Uh, but uh, John, he's very cool. He's very nice. Uh, very humble. Uh, very simple. Which you know you'd expect someone of that kind of level of celebrity to to be different but but actually yeah he's very simple always wears sweatpants doesn't make doesn't talk much about himself he's yeah very simple cool guy is he a good coach very good very yeah. good i think and do uh, you get time with him one on one or i mean like you get actual gym time with him or is it usually other instructors he is uh, he's very committed to the pro team uh, and the pro team is 5 days per week uh, in the afternoon, only on Wednesdays he doesn't uh, do the class, which is striking. Mm -hmm. uh, the other days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, he's always there, unless he's away. But most of the times he's there, mm -hmm. teaching stuff, looking at his fighters. He, uh, very often he does supervised uh, sparring. So it's like, like pretty much like a fight, just yeah. with extra gear and mm -hmm. like 80% of intensity. And you mean he spars with the protein? No, no, he looks after. Oh, he, okay. he gets like a guy who's preparing for the fight yeah. a few weeks before the fight or a month before the fight and then someone who's a good match for him. You kind of corner them and... Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of simulating a, basically a fight okay. and then he gives tips and that he does that a lot. Like almost every day there's one or two guys he, 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 he looks after. So there's a lot of attention he gives to, to his guys. Cool. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. So he's real hands-on, you'd say? Very much so. Yeah. I think yeah. him for him being a coach, and also we had a uh, chance to hang out quite a bit, especially in the, in the first couple of months, and uh, he, the, what I got from him is that for him, like all being a celebrity, quote-unquote, or whatnot, it's like he doesn't care that much about that. Mm -hmm. He does it because he needs to. It's it's his job. Mm -hmm. But what he's really interested in is just coaching his fighters. That's his whole life is about that. Excellent. Mm. I'd like to meet That's him cool, sometime. Yeah. 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 You, 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 you see some of these. No, no, never. But you see some of these like coaches like in the MMA scene who who try and you know attach their name to their the star fighter from their gym and stuff and try and build. A name for themselves, you know. But then you got like, you know, you got famous gyms like like Mike, like Jackson and Michael Jones gym and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But Kavanaugh, I think he's he's kept his head down. He like he got the fame when he when he coaches Connor, but like mm -hmm. uh, and Gunnar Nelson. But other times, you know, he just keeps it quiet and you just mm -hmm. you know, he just comes across as just a guy who's dedicated to that coaching lifestyle. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And it's also too one thing that I liked. He, uh, I feel he has a very good philosophy about stuff, like a lot, good life perspective. He he's mm -hmm. written a very nice book, uh, Win or Learn, which yeah. is like an easy book to read, but but a lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> it's funny because see uh, this book here, Karate Clever, that went up at, on the was it the martial arts section of yeah, Amazon, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it was him and Kavanaugh were fighting for <laughs> first, <laughs> first yeah. place on it. Yeah, the and his, went up and down a couple. His of first books. book, Karate Stupid, beat uh, Conor McGregor's book. Yeah. It was ahead of it yeah. in the charts, yeah. yeah. I was looking at that and you guys have to tell me, so what is this? What is it? So our, our instructor memoir. here, um, yeah. Scott Langley, um, is well known in the karate, in the Shotokan karate world. Um, he, he teaches all around the world, does seminars and stuff. He's away doing a seminar in Cincinnati just now. And uh, he, I think, his sort of fame in the karate world grew rapidly when he released this first book, Karate Stupid, and mm. it's about his time um, on the Kenjusei course in Japan, mm. um, and just his time being on the instructor's course and telling his story about how cruel the Japanese were to him when he was over there, oh. and, how he, <laughs> and just his five-year stint in Japan. And then the second book, Karate Clever, was is about his sort of... In, after he graduated the instructor's course, moving to Dublin, setting up a dojo, and the sort of ins and outs on, on how his sort of karate journey went as he made that trans transition from mm -hmm. student to instructor. Cool. Yeah, so it's uh, and uh, it's a good read, man. You should like, mm -hmm. yeah. Should check it out. The first one is all action, yeah, uh, all <laughs> fighting and stuff, and the second one is all intrigue, a lot of backstabbing, politics, a lot of politics, ah, trying yeah. to ma trying to juggle being. So kind of the student subservient to the yeah. Japanese, and then also, you know, becoming the sort of head of a 
mm-hmm. uh, sort of organisation in, in now, if you're a sensible UK. person like most people, you've no time for martial arts politics, and there's a lot of it in a traditional martial arts. Yes. Uh, but it's a good book. <laughs> Do you ever encounter <laughs> politics in in the Aikido world? Very much so. I was because uh, you stuck your head above the parapet, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I obviously, I <laughs> uh, encountered stuff already before, but I was though a very good student. I mean, a very good student. In, in as as a term, in the sense that I was very devoted, I didn't question things. I was just like uh, completely a very loyal, devoted student, and and that I believe plus creative worked a lot. And then I rose up to the ranks of one of the most important guys in the organization that I was at, uh, and so I definitely got to see like what's happening from the insides. Also, too, before I moved to that organization, my first organization that I belonged to, also I was very close to the instructor. So I got to hear many stories and see the insides, and a lot of them were not very nice. Obviously, there were good things, but yeah, politics are. There's always really people good. <laughs> trying to vie for power yeah. in every aspect of, of, of everything. And martial arts is no different, you know? Mm-hmm. No matter how much we pretend yeah. to be that warrior code, that, you know, yeah. Buddha and stuff, it just, yeah. It's very funny, <laughs> people specifically. People at the end of the day, mm-hmm. you know? I really, especially these days, I'm trying to tone down my my, you could say aggressiveness, but or whatever word you'd use for for. Not, I tend to go hard and heavy on Aikido, and I try to tone it down and kind of encompass because there are good things too, obviously. But I'm trying to balance them out with all the negative impressions that I have. But uh, but with the Aikido, it's funny that uh, one thing is funny is that technically it's the art of peace. But then when you look at the politics of Aikido, <laughs> it's a complete mess. You know? Like every teacher is the best and whatnot. That's so. great. The karate, the karate is no different. You know? yeah. I mean, it's the exact same thing in the karate yeah. world. It's, it's shocking. Like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, th- that book, the second book has got a lot of that sort of mm. political stuff going on in there. So it's a fun fun read, especially if you know who the... The names are all changed, but if you know, okay, who, the people, if you know who the people are, it's... it's that's what I was about fun. to ask. Because even these days when I make videos... Uh, like I was writing a script today for a new video and uh, I was thinking, so should I give examples about my instructor or not? Because I know from the past when I started questioning Aikido and I, although I didn't never used his uh, name, like specifically said he did this, I spoke about him, like some of the things he did and even like quite, quite, quite vaguely, but he t- took it very personally. Yeah. Um, like that, yeah. that I mentioned some of the, the bad, st- bad stuff he did. And again, it was like nothing compared to what I could say. Yeah. But, but he took it very personally. And I was wondering, like, so how did your, your, your oh, sensei navigate through all of that? It didn't go over well at he all. He got kicked out of the organization yeah. that he was in for uh, writing that book. That first book spelled yeah. the end of his time affiliated with Japan. Oh, I like yeah. And the second, the, <laughs> the second book has all that story yeah. <laughs> about how that happened. How he got kicked out. So yeah. the first one got him kicked out. Right? The first one got him kicked out. Uh, and forced then, out. And then we should forced say. out. Okay. And he yeah. said he wouldn't. He so he said he wouldn't release it as mm. a, a way of apologising because he sent a copy of it to them. Oh, okay. And said this is what because um, he didn't see the problem with it, but then it was ta- it was taken very badly and he and he got in a lot of trouble for it and he said okay I won't release it, um, and then they they stopped him from teaching internationally um, they suspended him yeah. for two years yeah. so he couldn't do a grading which was a big part of his income he couldn't oh. teach at official jks seminars and stuff these are all spoilers for the second book by the way yeah. <laughs> um so th- and they stopped him from from making a living basically yeah and um, after that they then said he needed to he need he was going to be suspended to. for two years and after his two years was up he had to compete in the world championships and, and re, you know him. like pro- reprove himself and regain his honor or something like How that did they <laughs> justify that though? Oh, they're wankers <laughs> right. i think it's that you know pete like i think they, they get away with so much because uh, i think in the karate world anyway people are so sort of in awe of you know, oh, karate comes from Japan, therefore the, whatever the Japanese instructors say is the be-all and end-all. Yeah. They treat them, you know, with that sort of, like, oh, they're so superior and stuff like that, rather than treating them like, oh, they're still a human being. They right. still, yeah. you know, they still, they still have to think things out the way we think out so, and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they, they get away, for, away with it all the time, that kind of behaviour, yeah. um, where they can just dismiss people and treat them like shit, whereas yeah. Scott was just like, no, I'll tell you this, I'm leaving, that's it. Well, you had a video taken down recently, didn't you? It was, yeah, it, I did, and it was, in the end, it's officially it's a misunderstanding, okay. which I tend to believe, uh, but it did, I look at it both ways. So I always, when I do, 
that could be like a fail, but it was two weeks ago. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then uh, the thing is, uh, I, I always try to look at the mistakes I did, kind of seeing, okay, so what did I do wrong in that situation? Mm -hmm. And and probably I did jump the gun. Okay. Like I, I went, I rushed in and saying, okay, look, this is suspicious. And I try to be kind of, uh, let's see, I don't know, political about it, but, but looking at it from both sides of the picture saying that maybe this is not what happened but I presume this is what happened yeah. and so I might have made that too quickly but but the thing is I made that announcement that okay that oh, the video got taken down for this reason yeah. but the thing is still the culture around all of that subject is is so bad that it's so easy to believe that this is what happened and and even so there's a chance that the reason that the video did taken down and to give a background to people who are listening yeah. it was it wasn't a negative video uh to a degree it could be but it was uh, critical about a certain video yeah. like giving feedback to it saying the good and the bad about it and then it got taken down soon enough and i i thought okay this might be a case where people just can't take feedback and but the thing you is you were the, critiquing an aikido video is that right yes okay. like a high level high ranking well-known aikido instructor mm -hmm. from japan and uh, I was praising a lot of the stuff he did, but critiquing the knife defense stuff he did. Okay. Saying that. So. <laughs> There's no such thing as knife defense, guys. Come on. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the good one, like, uh, like especially, I don't know, the, the best ones are the military guys who do it, and, or the you know, special forces guys, and they say, first thing they always say is, somebody pulls out a knife, and you're going to combat against a knife, you're going to get stabbed or cut yeah, or yeah, something. They always true, say, true. It's not, I think you're going, to, you're going to get injured, you know? For me, a, a big wide op uh, eye opener with uh, knife defense was when I was interviewing a Chicago uh, police uh, oh, cool. veteran. Like yeah, he was yeah, like yeah. part of the SWAT, and he was like an undercover cop. Like he went through everything. Yeah. So he's badass, and he's also an instructor for for police. And when I asked about uh, knives and guns, he said, "If there's a guy five feet in front of him, and he could choose whether the guy has a pistol or a knife, he would choose a pistol." Because a knife is that bad. Really? So, yeah, yeah that, that was his statement. Interesting. Because, you know, he said, the way he explained it, he said the, the, the gun is, it shoots where it points. Uh, so you can still, still evade it or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. he knows his stuff. But a knife, it has unlimited directions and it's a chaotic weapon. You can easily hide it. You can very quickly use it. So basically, yeah, it's, it's much more difficult to handle. And that, when he said that, I was like, whoa. Knives are scary. <laughs> so yeah, that's a weird one. It is interesting. Maybe, you know, that's that's maybe if the gun, gun was still some, holstered, some pro I don't gun know. stuff. I don't know. Like man, that, that's, <laughs> that's the that's the only person I heard seeing that. But I but I trust him. He's like he's he's really good at what he does. But yeah. but still, it's it's an interesting thought. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to have a conversation with that guy and be like. Surely what is way more lethal than the other, right? I do not know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's interesting though, yeah. But yeah, knife defense stuff or like uh like i you follow that McDojo mm -hmm. stuff. I mean that the stuff some of the stuff you see in that is even Anderson Silva the other day oh. was doing a knife defense video in Brazil really? and he was ducking under like head movement from the knife stab uh. and all that stuff. You were just like you know that's that's kind of the video I'm, I, I mentioned I was I'm writing a script for a new video today and uh, it's part of it is well, that um, that thing um, that you just mentioned, I'm talking about that, where when you have a black belt or a high level of recognized expertise in martial arts, uh, either people start to give you credit for things you don't deserve, like people start to consider like, oh, you know this, then like you're a black belt at this, you're, that means you're a black belt at everything. And sometimes the people fall in that delusion themselves. And so it's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a UFC champion, that means I I can I know how to deal with knives and it's yeah. like wait those yeah. are two different realms mm -hmm. like, absolutely because obviously like Adam Silva would kill like mm. with if it's just down to a fist fight like right, destroy exactly. everyone you know right. but, but yeah, actually, as soon as you add in that extra format it's strange eh? yeah and there's just one thing I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about I we're having a chat and everything but um, about you specifically now mm -hmm. because you just mentioned about how there's there's self defense and then there's MMA and mm -hmm. they're completely different realms. So you, I know I wouldn't talk about your transition, okay, sure. but you've gone from traditional martial arts to MMA, which is a sport. Yeah. Do you feel like a sports competitor now? Or do you feel like you're just exploring martial arts? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm, 
Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm actually on the fence, and this is the moment of transition because uh, I was supposed to have a fight in like two weeks. Oh yeah. But I heard, yeah. But I heard my ankle, oh, yeah. and uh, also too, it's, it was like actually a compilation of things. But officially, that that was the main reason, and it was the main reason. But also, I had to some traveling, uh, traveling booked. So so basically, I didn't have enough time to prepare for the fight. And I talked to to John uh, Kavanaugh, and he said it's better to just postpone it. And I looked at the whole situation and I realized, I started questioning myself. So, okay, so, so, so should I aim for having a fight, another fight, as soon as I can? And when I looked into myself, I realized probably that's not really my driving motivational force. I still feel I will have to, I will want to have a second fight. And in the past, I thought, do I want to try to become a professional fighter? Like, is that the way to go? Is that my next step? But after training with the pro guys, spending two months training MMA full time with, with, with in a high level facility, I realized probably that's not really what I'm looking for. I like it, and I think I will do it, but I don't think that's that my life is about that. I thought you were going to say that. Right, mm. right. So based so, on what I know about you, I thought that would be your right. answer. Yeah. So you don't want to be a professional sports person. No, in, mm -hmm. even if I would have went for uh, an attempt to go pro in MMA, I would have done it for the narrative and that that's how i describe it i i would think i would consider that to be a powerful uh narrative for people to to have an as inspirational kind of story like oh this aikido guy turned 30 started mma became pro but like to become a champion i realized that's not feasible for me that's that's it, on two levels one is it's it's you could say too late age-wise but also i i looked a lot into what a champion is like as I traveled and, and met various coaches, including John, I asked a bunch of guys, so, so what makes a champion? Like what's the, what's the secret sauce? And the answer I came down to is it's a lot about obsession. Yeah. Like those guys, mm -hmm. that's all they think about. And that seems to be the, the universal kind of connecting tissue that they're, they're obsessed about it. They are always thinking about the techniques. They're trying to understand it. And I looked at myself and I realized I'm not that guy. You know, I like training i like understanding things but i'm not obsessed you know when i'm not training i'm not training when i'm training i'm training and i think about it sometimes but i'm not like lying in bed and thinking oh what about this technique what about that technique i'm not like watching youtube videos tutorials whatever i used to do that with aikido with mma no so i thought you know if it's not really that much part of myself so i think i have more power to influence people by being what I like the, the, the term you use, like an explorer, mm -hmm. than trying to pretend I'm an MMA fighter. I see. Yeah. So, yeah. shit, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> shit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, what I, yeah, but I was having a conversation with a friend of mine just yesterday, and she said that that kind of drive and obsession can certainly get you to a high level. Right. And uh, she used the example of how there's a disproportionate number of psychopaths in mm -hmm. positions of power such as CEOs and politicians and stuff good, but good, yeah. but being that myopic and being that obsessive is never conducive to a health, healthy lifestyle yeah. and you can read Karate Stupid and you know all about it like Scott nearly went completely crazy in Japan yeah, yeah. Uh, because all he was doing was karate getting, and getting beat up every day and yeah. he wouldn't quit <laughs> so he used to vomit before he went into yeah training but it's not so conducive scared, like, to a healthy lifestyle yeah. and I think well, what my friend was trying to say is that your mental health is the most important thing. Yeah, and, is, yeah. and, a, and a, you need to be a, a, a yeah, like your motivation, like you say, needs to be a different caliber to go into something like prize fighting. Yeah. I think like you can like to want to be a complete martial artist and be like I don't know, like if you if you're doing because people do martial arts for a bunch of different reasons, right? For self confidence, to be able to defend themselves, you know, um, for fitness, all these different things, and depending on what your goal is depends on where your martial arts will take you right and i think that there's people who watch a conor mcgregor when they're mm. 10 years old and decides i'm going to be like that and that's yeah. that that's their motivation to get into martial arts and stuff yeah. but if you're martial arts for example aikido you obviously weren't looking for fame or limelight or anything yeah. like that you were doing martial arts for the sake of martial arts right it was well it was for was it for self-defense or was it were you one of these japanophiles who like japan <laughs> or like what? it was a mix but self-defense was a big big question for me because i grew up in a difficult area so being attacked was common so i thought aikido is the way to go because i was a peaceful kid and i thought oh aikido self-defense peace perfect yeah. so but but obviously i love japan and samurai and anime and whatnot so yeah
So, I find that everyone who does Aikido loves the. the it is, yeah. Like Mark. Yeah. Mark is mad for it. He, Mark lo- just he, loves, he loves all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we have a brown belt in the dojo who's a former mm. Aikika? Aikido Aikido. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, he's stone mad for anime. What's your favorite anime, Rokas? I really love Attack on Titan. Yes! Oh, yes! yes! <laughs> Fry <laughs> to <laughs> heaven! <laughs> it is very good. It's yeah, we love it, man. I'm looking forward for the, the last Oh, season. they take so long, though. It's going to be the final season, isn't it? I think it's so. five years from now or something. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it is very, very good. But others, I like. I used to like Samurai Champloo. Yes, yeah. That's a good that. one. It's a fun anime, but my taste is varied. Uh, yeah. I'm not stuck with. But I do watch the more general ones, like the ones people know. I'm not the one who dives deep into. Yeah, no, same. We wouldn't be super fans no. like Mark. Ma- Mark is, yeah. Mark's always he doesn't shout. So you see, as soon as you, you got to be careful, as soon as you mention it out loud, Mark would be like, boom, and he'll give you like 20 different... Have you different seen this anime, man? It is the best one of the animation, man. He's so sick. <laughs> He's French. He goes into oh, like, yeah. so oh, deep, man. Yeah. I know a French guy similar like that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was creeping on your Instagram. Uh, you were wearing a pretty cool Dragon Ball Z t-shirt there love the other that. day with Shenron on it and Dragon Ball. That's my first yeah. love. Absolutely. Yeah, same. That's same. same. Yeah. Dragon Ball Z, it was a big influence on me. Actually, when I look back, I had a number of influences that I recognize. And the the most common people know, uh, because I put on T-shirts with it, is Batman. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> I remember that from your early stuff. You were always wearing a Batman yeah, 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 T-shirt. Yeah. It's the, 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 actually, it's a funny story how that happened. Uh, the thing is, in the Aikido culture, uh, the one I belong to, it, being a sensei was kind of... Uh, there was a certain mode you'd have to get into. It's like you, 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 couldn't, you could do certain things and you shouldn't do other things. And like wearing a Batman t-shirt was not a go-to thing for a sensei. Yeah. Oh. And so I was kind of discouraged to do that, although I love Batman. And when I started getting uh, stepping away from the organization, I realized I love Batman. And actually I used to buy Batman t-shirts. I would see like a cool t-shirt, I, I would buy it, but I wouldn't wear it because I couldn't. And then when I dropped out of, when I went out of the organization, I was like, I was wearing it every day. I was just switching that. <laughs> just a big fuck you. So their influence on you was that totalitarian. Like you couldn't w- wear what you wanted to wear because you thought they'd disapprove. It wasn't uh, directly, s- it wasn't like directly no, forbidden. It was unsaid. But it was suggested. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, hey, are you sure you want to wear this? You know, what will people think about you? How will your students consider you? And what <laughs> but you like Batman. Anything. You don't think about Batman. <laughs> And so, so when I started realizing, waking up to that truth that this is weird, yeah, things started falling apart. So. Yeah. When Scott hired me, I had hair down to my ass. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ah, I saw those pictures as well. That, yeah. that looked cool. <laughs> I cut it off very quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so, MMA is what you're doing just now. Is that going to be the, like, is it MMA, did you choose MMA just because you thought that was the most complete Were you looking at my notes up? about what questions I wanted to ask him? <laughs> he knows you so well. <laughs> just, just a natural <laughs> way to go. Yeah. Uh, like, is that, is that going to be the, is, you're doing that, are you doing that just now because you think that's the most sort of complete form of self-defense? And is that where you're going to finish or have you got another step planned ahead for your journey? Like, is there somewhere else that you're ready to go to? You know, there's kind of another two, chapter. There's two parts to this answer so one of them is uh, before in the past I used to know very well what my life will be like five ten years later I had very clear vision plans these days I'm avoiding it because I want to kind of explore life and see where it takes me so I, I'm not sure exactly I'm, I have a feeling for what the next step is going to be I'm not sure what the next next step is going to be so it's hard to say but in general looking at the subject uh, the first stage was Aikido then actually the second stage was self-defense. I was exploring the world of self-defense, uh, going to seminars, trying out different systems, going to different uh, yeah, seminars, uh, trying out different... <laughs> Way too loud, man. <laughs> uh, trying out different systems and interviewing a lot of guys about that. And uh, eventually I feel like I found my answer uh, for self-defense. Not to say that I'm an expert or what whatsoever, but but I realized self defense is so much about prevention, and it's much more about prevention than I knew, and much more, it's 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 totally different from what usually I think traditional martial arts sometimes fall 
into that uh, wrong assumption that self defense is about fighting and it's like so it's about if someone does this you do exactly that. exactly but what about so how my you unbeatable get 11 step yeah. sequence right <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and if you know how to if you know the right theory it's like 80 you're 80 90 percent you're good yeah one of uh, i mean was it rick that said this or scott anyway uh mm -hmm. one of the guys we train with um he said uh budo uh most people call it the martial way yeah. but i think if you get deep into the etymology of it go on crack it open i'll do mine too there we go <laughs> <laughs> if you get into the etymology of it it's the art of halting conflict yeah. or the way of halting conflict so and what scott our boss says is best self-defenses don't be there yeah absolutely yeah when I realized that, and I went through an instructor's course for Spear, I don't know if you heard about mm. that system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, really. It's, cool. it's a good one. Actually, I went there. I went the, to the course in Scotland. Um, when was that? Edinburgh. 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 Yeah, Edinburgh. Yeah, Edinburgh. Yeah. The best city in the world. Yeah. It was, no, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very nice place. I was, yeah, yeah. I was impressed by it. Uh, usually, I'm, I'm hard to be hard to get be impressed by cities or whatnot but Edinburgh was like wow uh, anyway <laughs> uh, but yeah so I went through the course there and, and did a lot of investigation and by the end of it uh, I did a couple of more months of exploration in that and I realized yeah I know most of what I feel I need to know uh, but I realized I'm still not a capable fighter and when I looked back it was funny to realize that when I was a teenager I actually won it to know how to fight. And I actually wanted to compete at least to a certain degree. But that was suppressed in me by the Aikido community yeah. because it's about non-competition and that's considered to be brutal, whatnot. And when I saw that MMA is, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA is a different culture than what I was believe, led to believe, that it's actually, to a degree, it's actually a healthy uh, community. It depends, obviously there are bad cases, but, and hitting your head is not a smart way to go. Uh, but, but the way uh, a lot of individuals that I met who are doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or MMA actually are nice people. And so I was interested, okay, so what will happen to me if I go through this? And the confidence that I am gaining from MMA and just the knowledge, it's kind of a weird thing to admit, but realizing, I think every guy imagines himself like, what if this guy would attack me? What if I, what I would do and, and if, yeah. if I would handle myself? And with the Aikido, I always had doubts. I always I was like, oh, I, I, in her, in, inside, I knew that I'm not confident. Uh, with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu MMA, hopefully it's it's real, but I tend to believe it is real because you're getting used to fighting guys who really know how to fight. And then when you imagine yourself fighting against somebody who doesn't know how to fight, you're like, hmm, that's not so scary at all. And that's a nice feeling to have. And so I kind of challenged myself to reach a level where I could handle good guys in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA just to feel like I can do it. But but I don't think like that's gonna, going to define me. Yeah. yeah. What you're talking about isn't <clears throat> unusual. Um, most people probably won't acknowledge it. But what I've read is that uh, if you study uh, body language, mm -hmm. when a man talks to a man, yeah. um, there's always things that they're doing which signifies that there's a threat of violence. Yeah. Even if it's two blokes in the office at the water cooler or something. Mm -hmm. so there's things that, that they'll do, there's ways that they'll turn, yeah. there's ways that they'll hold their arms or their hands yeah. that, that uh, implies that there's a threat of physical violence. Mm -hmm. It's that alpha male stuff, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Trying to, no, trying I sound to... like Jordan Peterson as well. <laughs> 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 no, but like, Dawkins was talking about it on Joe Rogan the other day. Yeah. It's like, like that alpha male stuff, it's like you're trying to, you're always programmed to like I'm the one that will get all the mates yeah but no, what I'm not what I'm what I'm afraid people will pick me up as saying you gotta be the alpha or you gotta mm. you know you, oh, it's just acknowledging that, that yeah. it's there yeah and that there is something primal and it's normal to look at other men and say how would I come off against that guy yeah especially if you're a martial artist you're, come on. Well, you, you, <laughs> I think so yeah yeah um, and especially if you've had like you like you're saying you've had experiences of being attacked um, and stuff like like if you anyone listening has like you're always you know once you've done that it's always in the back of your mind I think like forever more mm -hmm. when you've been had an experience like that where it's like okay if some ha if you're sitting at the bar and it's like oh, okay if something kicks off here what's going to happen like mm -hmm. what's going to happen how am I going to deal with it and uh, I think that's the beauty of martial arts is that martial arts is so tough it makes everything else easy mm -hmm. and those situations like again situations back in scotland where you know you're at the end of the night you're drunk coming out of the nightclub or something and you see people mouthing mm -hmm. off and you somebody comes to you you're so like calm yeah 
compared to everyone everyone else is like you know getting all chesty and you know shouting and stuff and you're just like mate I'm going this way what way are you going okay yeah. I'll go the opposite way it doesn't matter I'll leave you yeah. or mm-hmm. somebody bumps into you in the bar or something it's like and they start start on you it's like I'll buy you a drink come on I'll, I'll buy you if a pint you, rather than escalating yeah. things you know if it's all about de-escalation if you prove yourself in the dojo every day you don't need to prove yourself in those yeah. circumstances mm. you have the confidence to know number one if shit kicked off you'd be alright you could handle yourself and number two Shit doesn't have to kick off if you calm the situation down and you've got nothing to prove because yeah. you proved yourself this morning when Scott kicked you. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't crumple up and cry. <laughs> That's it. Very, very true. And uh, for me, I, I did consider the whole, especially living in Portland. Portland is very, they call it progressive. Yeah. So the whole toxic masculinity, feminine versus uh, masculine is, is a big a very subject. woke city, right? Oh, sorry? A very woke city. People woke. are kind of like woken up to social Enlightened. issues oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost, I wouldn't even say too much. I won't, wouldn't even say almost. It's, it's too much. Uh, it's, they do it too much. Uh, the I'd bloody say. PC brigade. <laughs> it's, yeah, they, they, yeah. I think they don't have real problems in their lives, so they're looking for problems which, you know, are not always important to look at but still that that obviously influenced me and i thought about that whole masculinity toxic mas- masculinity and even that like toxic masculinity was addressed in me when i was uh, when i moved to become an uchideshi in the aikido community that was addressed like like it wasn't named as toxic masculinity but but i was getting uh, into trouble because of being too toxic masculine oh my god uh, cool you should yep. bring out. You should put up a video about feminism and Aikido. I actually thought about it, and yeah. now that you say, it, I, I wasn't like, I wasn't sure if I should do it. But now that you said it, <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. We tried to do it on our podcast, yeah. um, <laughs> but we didn't have any women on the episode, so it didn't go down too yeah. well. <laughs> we were just like, women in the dojo, man. What do we think? <laughs> <laughs> we did state multiple times. As men, we're not saying we're experts. This is just our observations, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, but so for me, the man, that was kind of suppressed again, uh, and in some in some degrees, the the masculinity side, and part of it was toxic, but part of it I think was just masculinity, and and later, especially when I started doing MMA, that that is a very masculine sure. practice, yeah. uh, and when I started doing it, I realized I'm rediscovering my masculinity in a healthy way, uh, and and that ability to just, as you mentioned before, <laughs> that ability to feel calm in a stressful situation and kind of hold yourself and to be able to say, can I swear in this? Oh, stuff? fuck yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the, like, what the fuck are you doing, guys? You know, like, like I remember just a couple months uh, I, when, when I came into Dublin, I, the first week I had to spend in hostels and there was a group of guys, like they were big guys, but older gentlemen uh, from some weird country. I don't they know. They were English. <laughs> Nah, <laughs> no, someone else. But anyway, Somewhere but they terrible. were <laughs> they were making noise, like like they were making loud noises when or talking to each other loudly when when it was supposed to be quiet, and obviously everybody was pissed in the room, upset about them. This is going to be a cool story. <laughs> no, actually, well, anyway, it wasn't as it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like in movies. But but I I realized I wanted to say something about that. But part of me that kind of. Uh, self-preservation part was thinking like well if i start giving them shit they might yeah. gang up and beat the shit the shit out of me but still i realized you know i know the basics of self-defense i know some mma and i had like my tripod and i imagine myself <laughs> the tripod is a good weapon by the way i actually thought about it a few times and then like you know if they will want to have physical conflict i will you know i'll take it on you know, and and you know i will i'm not an easy guy to handle to just trash these days one of them is going to lose an eye <laughs> yeah exactly right at least one of them is going to lose an eye how tall then, are you Rokas? Uh, I'm uh, should I say in feet or in uh, feet uh, six free around carry on tall it's way. pretty tall, tall yeah. Way. yeah and tall gaining way. weight as well yeah. but then uh, that thought process did went for me and I realized you know what fuck it if they if they if it's going to get physical you know I'm not backing out uh, but then um, and then yeah I just stood up and said you know, guys, do you realize this is a hostel? You know, this is like, do you realize it's past 10? People are sleeping. What the fuck are you doing? And they became more quiet, but then they, for after 10 minutes again, they're being loud. And I, and I said that to them again, and they still were loud. So I just, what I did, I went out of the room, went to the reception, said, these fuckers, you know, they're making noise. And they later got a big 
like penalty, which was oh, you know, big fine, yeah. nice. I was like so happy <laughs> about that. But the whole process. Yeah, so, so the moral of the story there, guys, is rat on everyone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but actually, the funny the funny part was the next day in the morning uh, there was like breakfast, communal breakfast, and I could feel like those guys were walking around me and i was like uh, and i felt like my masculine ego was like oh yeah <laughs> i cannot deny that but it was but it was you know the fun thing is is it was the right thing to do and nobody was else was able to do it because nobody else had that masculine confidence to to, to handle that situation so so i realized part of the the reason i was able to do that was because i practice uh, full contact sports. Brilliant. Great story, man. Brought it back yeah. to martial arts nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so Cool. So you've trained with, a, or you've at least spoken to, a lot of pretty famous people. Mm. Uh, I was a big fan of your Peter Constantine video. Mm, right. um, you've talked to Jesse Ancamp a good few times. Yeah. You've met with his brother a good few times. Mm. You were training with him in Dublin, were you? All of yeah, it? actually, uh, when we met, I was in Stockholm filming stuff for Jesse and uh, got to know Oliver, and, and he always wanted to go to Esbedi, and I said, you know what, I'm going to be there at that time, and he had vacation, so he came down, and for a week we just trained and uh, spent a lot of time together, so. And you've talked to Ian Abernethy? Yeah. Anybody else I should mention? Uh, you know, there's some UFC guys these days, but, but it depends on who you're interested in, so. Oh, Ross knows a lot more about UFC than I do. Yeah. But, I don't um, know much either. <laughs> was, uh, have you got any, so what I want to ask yeah. you is, have you got any sensei moments? Now, mm -hmm. Ross and I experience sensei moments with our senseis from time to time when they say something which makes you stop in your tracks and go, whoa. Just Not only is that a good lesson about karate, that's a good lesson about life. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, like one really good one recently was just, well, sometimes, I mean, if you get Scott on form after a fair few beers, he'll just start <laughs> telling you exactly how you ought to be living your life. Yeah. And it makes you really hum. It's, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, you, you had a nice one from Cameron talking about violence, yeah? He, he said that, mm -hmm. like, when somebody tries to say that your martial art, your martial art is violence or, or the fact that you're practicing MMA or, or whatever martial art you're doing, it's a violent practice. You say, well, violence is someone imposing violence on someone who doesn't want yeah. to be harmed. And whereas if both people agree to it and you're engaging in that martial art, then it's it's different. Yeah, it's not, it's not Right, violence. it's difficult to define as violence for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a good moment for sure. Well, which, which I would say is an example of a sensei moment. Yeah, that's kind yeah, of, oh, yeah. like one that makes you go, oh, that's really nice. Nice way of putting it. No. Can you think of any sensei moments to tell us about? Take your time. I think, yeah, I think I had plenty in a way. Like, that's... I'll bring it to a quick background story. So, which which was an, kind of an interesting twisting point in my life where I, I was doing this walk for, like, a 200-kilometer walk. Mm -hmm. So, like a... Yosh, it's a big walk. It's, 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 a, <laughs> it's a good walk, like five days. Uh, and so it was kind of a contemplative walk, and and, uh, and I had some people sometimes joining me because I announced that I will do that walk. And one photographer was with me uh, for one day, and we were walking together, and we were you know, talking about life, as you do in, in long hikes. And I asked him a question, which I like to ask is, uh, who are you looking up to? Like, who's your, the person you're, you're, that's your role model or you're taking inspiration from? And he said, oh, there's too many guys. And he gave me some examples. And without me thinking about that, he asked me, so who's your guy? And I realized because that day I was still mainly focusing on Aikido. I was slowly getting out of it, but, but I was still an Aikido guy. And I realized that there's no one that I'm looking up to. And in the past, that was a huge, huge thing for me, to, to have someone that would be a role model for me, that would inspire me. And I realized that's such a bad situation to be in. And so I started looking for people that inspires me, and part of the martial arts journey is about that, uh, because I feel it's so important to find, to hang around, to hang out uh, around people that are bigger than you, because then you start to think like what you could be. So for me, that's a huge part. And uh, during the past couple of years, I, I, I was lucky to meet a lot of people with great achievements. And I feel part of it is becoming, you're, you're kind of, I, as much as I hate to say it, part of me started becoming used to it. It's like you always have these conversations and, and everyone is so wise and you're kind of like, okay, this is normal. You know? yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you go to a bar with people you don't know and they don't think about much about life and you're like, oh, wow. Not, not everyone is, you know, so interesting. Uh, not everyone ponders their path up the mountain. Exactly, much, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so I, I think part of it, part of me is, is, is just taking it all as a single experience. So it's hard to single out 
uh, one thing, but when I if I if I have to one of the major you have to I have to. <laughs> <laughs> one of the major moments when I had was with Matt Thornton, the founder of Straight, Straight Bus Gym, uh-huh. uh, which I consider to be one of the most influential talks I had ever. Plus, it's recorded, and uh, he said I, I, a lot of guys I used to ask. What's, what was their advice for me as an Aikido guy trying to make it efficient? Because that was the stage I was in. And most of the people would say, oh, do a little Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, do a little bit of boxing, do some cross-training, learn some self-defense, whatever. Uh, and Matt, he's a, he's a stoic kind of guy. <laughs> Very straightforward, doesn't talk about things he doesn't have to talk. And his answer was, I think you should quit Aikido. That was like as straightforward as that. And that caught me off guard. I was like, what is this answer? But then he started explaining it. He said, life is too short to do things you don't, uh, that, that are not the most useful to you. Or, or, or it's like life is too short to do things you're, yeah, which are not getting you as quick as, you, as, quick as some, something else could to the place you want to be at. And uh, he spoke more about that, but that idea of life is short and I shouldn't waste time, that was always an idea I embraced, but I never thought about it in martial arts. And when he said that to me, it really clicked, resonated, and a couple months later, I closed my dojo. Sweet. Wow. Wow. And it's all his fault. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, nice one. That was a good one. Cool. So do do you find, like, do you think your time with Aikido is wasted then, or do you see benefits of spending all that time practicing that art like do you find the like any sort of usefulness out of it maybe not even in a it doesn't have to necessarily be in a martial arts sense but just in like mental and and the sort of the methodology the the, uh, method of it anything like that like do you see the value in aikido for people who are maybe listening who do aikido (laughs) that are are cutting themselves (laughs) themselves some harakiri that are like (laughs) I have to be honest to say that there are two parts in me. If I would say like, if I would try to pretend to be wise and, you know, enlightened, I would say, oh no, of course, I'm, this is, everything is for a reason and whatnot. Uh, but if I'm honest, part of me does feel like, oh crap, what if I would have done functional martial arts earlier? Or what if I started questioning things earlier? Uh, another part of me does realize that if I wouldn't have went through that path, I would not be where I am now. That's kind of the defining, that, that's my defining narrative. That's my defining experience. The fact that I went for Aikido and I was so deep into it that when I went out of it, I had, uh, I do have these days um, insights which you can't really have unless you went through this journey. And the fact that it's recorded on video how I went through that process, it's very unique. Yeah. So I'm lucky that I went through that in that way. So I appreciate that part at the same time. Uh, in terms of what I took out of it, uh, I, I admit that a lot of the mentality, uh, there's obviously bad mentality that I had to shed, which was a difficult process. When I, sorry, when I fell out with my instructor, my main Aikido instructor, he was like a life coach to me at the same time. And it was a difficult process because it was all like a mixed bag. And I was like, so naturally I, I felt like throwing away the whole thing. So the quote of, the phrase of throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. That's what I did initially because I was like, this is disgusting. I don't like this. And I threw it away. But I started looking at it and realizing some of the stuff he said to me, some of the stuff I learned from Aikido in terms of life perspective was good. And I still apply it to today. It took a long time to kind of separate the good from the bad. But by now I realize, yeah, a lot of the things like uh, kind of the... The, it depends on also which school you're at in terms of Aikido, but the one I was at, we spoke a lot about the flow of kind of being at the right place at the right time, of being in sync with life, and, and the founder spoke about that too, kind of being, uh, feeling that you're part of the whole and that there's a greater reason for your life, that it's, it all has a meaning. All of that stuff, I feel it was, had a very positive influence on it me. Sounds kind of Taoist, yeah, going does. with the flow. True. Yeah, true. So, <clears throat> you used to live and breathe Aikido. Yeah. And you're still living and breathing martial arts, but you're training in a completely different way. Mm. Is there anything, like on an emotional level, that you used to get from your training in Aikido that you still get, or is it? Can you, or is it completely different? Like your experience when you train, are there certain responses you get, certain feelings you get inside your body that you can relate to when you used to train Aikido? 
Could you give me an example, just to make sure I uh, right? Yeah, let me think. So I, uh, well, we train karate here and we we sweat a lot, especially in our morning sessions. Mm. We, we get a really good workout done and our heart rate is up. And in those moments, I feel completely alive yeah. and I love it. And I can get the same experience when I go to a Muay Thai session. Don't go as often as I used to, mm -hmm. but I fucking love just hitting pads, hitting pads like a monster until I can't barely stand up anymore. So when we do a Tabata session here, mm -hmm. you, have you ever tried Tabata? No, what is it? No, it's uh, interval training. It's hell. High intensity oh, interval okay. training, but it's yeah. a certain kind, uh, certain okay. intervals that are set by this Japanese doctor who mm -hmm. came up with a good way, oh, uh, a hellish way to train. Um, so yeah, so I know that if I do that I can get that in karate and I can also get that in martial, in different martial arts training. But I'm wondering, is there something that you can get from Aikido that you can also get when you're doing MMA? It maybe is. maybe uh, like a, another example would be camaraderie. It's great camaraderie in this dojo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu sessions are famous for the friendliness and uh, yeah. the camaraderie and brotherly love. Yeah. MMA would be a tough one because it does feel like it's a different the end of the spectrum, like yeah. if Aikido is on the left of being soft and philosophical, traditional, MMA is definitely on the other edge. Uh, BJJ is more kind of towards the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a bit of the tradition, I mean, they, they are wearing gis and, and there is the bowing sometimes. And so, so it's more relatable, I think. And um, so I feel in Jiu-Jitsu sometimes I do get that, or that sense of maybe even in Aikido I used to really tune in to, to be able to pick stuff up, like I would be very focused and uh, in the moment whenever somebody is explaining something. And I feel that, I can feel that in actually Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and MMA, when the coach is explaining something, I'm fully much, I'm fully there, trying to replicate the movements and, and kind of taking that as a challenge of, okay, this is a technique and how do I make, the, make it work, trying to understand how it works. Uh, that sense I could see on all different realms. Um, Would I be right in saying that's like a mindfulness in training? In where way, you're yeah, focused yeah. on just one thing. Very, very much so. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but in in regards to sparring, it is very different, <laughs> especially MMA sparring. I think like what I felt because I I've dabbled in MMA and Jiu Jitsu mm. and Thai belts and stuff back in Scotland, and I found the like what is probably the most sort of scoffed at in terms of the karate world is kata, right? Because mm. we're sort of it's like people who don't do karate, just look at it as some sort of silly dance. silly dance that we're doing, right? But when you're thinking about how your body's moving, timing, the transition, shift the body weight, all that stuff, the sort of flow that you can get while doing these sort of techniques or your kihon, which is like your basics going up and down the floor, just doing moves in midair, like if you go into what you're actually trying to train and get your body to do, I found the satisfaction in finding the flow, like similar satisfactions in doing certain kata, doing certain... Uh, pieces of the cat in a certain way, the flow you get there to like a sweep in jiu-jitsu, mm. for example. Like they, you can find, like do you ever find that similar in Aikido where you've got certain, you have to work with your partner, the timing, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff has to be flowing well. And it's the same thing when you're rolling with someone, right? I mean, yeah. you right, high level grapplers, you know, will we'll never stop. They'll yeah. boom, they'll tap and then they'll continue on and move into the next sort of sequence and the, the next sort of exchange and then tap and then go again and it never kind of stops. Whereas, yeah you have that kind of trying try to tough it out and grab and pull and it's like sort of more about that body strength and the sort of raw physicality rather than that yeah. pure technique. Do you ever find that? Do you ever find those pockets of similarity where it's like, ah, this is like, that felt so natural, like the way that you, the level, you same level you got to Aikido. Do you ever find those moments? Yeah, very much so. It is somewhat, uh, somewhat different, uh, but because again, in the Aikido, the pressure is, is not as evident. I yeah. mean, the, the resistance level, uh, but that sense of flow, is there and and also another thing you you reminded me is also the ability to let go uh, which in i would presume probably everyone when they start aikido part of them is upset about the fact that i do the technique on you and then you do the technique on me and i remember when i started as a teenager uh i was like so if i'm better why would I let you do the technique <laughs> on me? <laughs> so what the heck is this? That's great. <laughs> yeah. But then eventually I, I eased into it and I realized, okay, it's, it's, it's when you sometimes win, you sometimes lose, and it's important to, to share, share, share the dy dynamic. Why would I learn to fall? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one's going to throw me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, I will do it anyway. Uh, but, 
part of part of uh, Matt Thornton's uh, teaching is, and it's kind of a universal Brazilian Jiu Jitsu teaching too, is that uh, losing is an essential part of eventually winning or learning. And uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is famous for the fact that you have to tap out a thousand, ten thousand, if not a hundred thousand times before you get to a black belt. It's impossible to get to a black belt unless you've tapped out thousands of thousands of times. Yeah. And and if the people who have a hard time with it, especially big guys, and I heard numerous stories about that, where they they're spazzing out, they're they're always tense, they're always trying to win, using their weight and power as an advantage, they're learning very slow. They're Missing very bad right, yeah. they're very bad students and, and they're it takes and eventually some of them if they keep up they break down and they realize that and they switch yeah. but it's just it slows their process dramatically and i feel for me having been in the aikido mindset of of win win some lose some that it did uh, help me out a lot in both aikido and mma like mma is also a tough game because again there's always going to be someone better than you and you will always find someone who will kick your ass and that can be a demotivating factor uh, but if you are, if you realize, okay, this does not define me. This is I lost against this person, but if I would fight against this against this person, I would have the upper hand. Or sometimes you do, and having that mindset helps to kind of keep consistent and and also be open for lessons. Yeah, I think it's that like self awareness, like is is really important in terms of training, no matter what martial art you're doing, right? Because again, being self aware that you're there's going to be eventually if you're muscling through techniques yeah. on the on the mat there's going to be someone who's stronger than you and has the technique you know and it's and it's not going to make the difference uh, and i think that when you have someone like my experience when i was doing mma in, uh, back in scotland like i was like like i would always go against bigger heavier guys who would have the strength and the technique on me who'd been doing it for much longer so i was tapping all the time but i would i would always just be like okay how did you get me what could i have done to stop like you're always ask like i would always ask how could I have saved myself from that there? And they would always help you out and stuff like that. But whereas if you take it personally, like you're failing yeah. rather than just learning, like it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a lose-lose, right? You know, there's, you're not getting any benefit from tapping, whereas tapping can be, again, the best way to learn, like you're saying, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Something we meant to ask you earlier. Mm -hmm. How are the dogs? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are two dogs, <laughs> two huskies, which used to be part of my channel because especially I used to let them in the dojo. Yeah. And that was a controversial subject <laughs> because not everyone is right, not everyone is happy on of dogs being on the mat, but uh, but actually the students I initially I was thinking, should I let them on the mat or not? But then the students would always like, Oh, come here, come here and I was like, Okay, this is like useless to fight. So eventually they were on the mat and they were in the videos and sometimes my vlogs. Um, the thing is, as you probably know, uh, some people know already, uh, I'm not with my partner anymore, the the, girl, the wife that I had. Uh, so we separated the dogs. She's taking the black girl, the black husky, and I'm taking the white guy. Uh, now he's back home with my parents because, uh, I mean, I, I travel too much these days yeah. and I didn't take him. But uh, when I'm coming back to Lithuania in a couple of weeks, moving to the capital, Vilnius, I'm definitely planning to take him with me. And one of my dreams is actually to, uh, might be difficult to do it right away, but in, eventually to have him travel with me. Oh, yeah. So, nice. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah. The martial arts Companion. journey dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> You know, even cool. Batman had a bat dog for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so. And what are their names? Uh, so the girl is Inaya. Which means uh, benevolent in oh sorry my nose, which means benevolent in uh, Sanskrit, and oh, it nice. really fit her for most of the time until she got her brother, and then she became a bit of <laughs> a bit more kind of pissy. <laughs> 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 but the the guy is uh, technically it's Grinch, you know the Grinch who stole Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Lithuanian, it's Grinch us because we add us to the end uh -huh. oftentimes. But uh, his name is Grinch because he was born unexpectedly f during Christmas and he ruined the Christmas of the <laughs> oh, people who yeah, brought yeah, him yeah. in. And, and the name suits him. He's a bit of a wild, funny dog. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. That'd be great if you could bring your dog with you on your martial arts adventures. <laughs> yeah. That'd be really nice. That's what we need, man. <laughs> a dojo dog. A donkey.
Okay, okay. Dojo Donkey, come with us to Italy next year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, Jesse and Oliver, I visited them in their in their dojo in Stockholm, and Oliver has a dog. Uh huh. It's it's a fairly new one, but he brings it to the dojo, and it works out very well. How big is their dojo? Is it huge? It's it not, could, no, it looks it's way big. bigger than I thought. Yeah. Because it's two, two and a half floors. Like the third floor is like an office, but yeah. the second floor or the first floor, it's big enough. But then you go to the basement, and there's a huge hole. Uh, You've seen that scene on there? YouTube. Yeah, but you you know how it's really yeah, sense to have. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely big. It's yeah. it's not huge, but it's it's a big dojo. Bigger than this dojo, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, like Isn't the first floor is similar. A bit, it's a big bigger. <laughs> the fact is, the is first floor. <laughs> yeah, the first floor. <laughs> this is a bit nicer than this one. Yeah. It's getting old, old this dojo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Karate the Shack. That's what we should change it to. I think it's Karate Shack International. <laughs> yeah. It's nice too. I think yeah. you can be super clean and fancy, but also a dojo. Part it's of a it is, bit is dojo. Yeah. yeah, it's it's part, you, part of it. Party wants the dojo to be kind of vibrant and alive and sure. This oh, one, cool. oh, this one's alive, all right. <laughs> There's stuff living in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was cool. It was cool. It's like the, the it's a nice wee community we've got in here. You know, like mm. kids and we have parties in here all the time and stuff like that. You know, for the for the whole like all the members and stuff like that. Christmas parties, you know, summer parties, barbecues and stuff like that. It's nice, you know. Uh, I think people who are like like you say, oh, how dare dog go in the dojo? It's like. Calm down, man. At the end of the day, it's just a place to train, really. Yeah. yeah. Like when I first started uh, training here, there was a dog that used to come in a lot. Yeah, remember? one of the kids had a, like yeah. a, the, a brand new dog, and the, it used to come running in all excited and stuff. Eventually, got used to it and didn't care anymore. But yeah. initially, used to run in and like sometimes if they didn't have one, the leash would run on the dojo and stuff. But <laughs> I thought it was great. Loved it. Well, what you're mentioning is something I really appreciate about martial arts, and I think it's. People are subconsciously uh, appreciating it as well, but sometimes it's not emphasized as much as it could be. Is the community, yeah. and not every dojo or gym is a community, but if it is, uh, it's actually one of my kido instructors who told me that idea initially. Is that it's one of the few places where you can, where people of different backgrounds and ages and social status can meet as equals. Yeah. Oh man, we've got a lot of weirdos in this dojo. <laughs> Bruce, <laughs> Bruce, there's convinced only weirdos do cry. There's no normal people here. <laughs> Ian was kind of, you know, Bernetti was kind of pointing to the same thing. Yes, he said only you have weirdos. to be a bit only crazy dorks. to be karate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then yeah. it's great to have a place to get together. Yeah, true. Sure. Uh, Bruce got a great Ian Abernethy. Uh, Ian hmm? I'm not going to do it on do, the podcast go on, again. Do, do it, Ian. Go on, do it. I love it. So. I was talking to Rokas here, he's the Aikido guy. <laughs> he come from Lithuania, and uh, right now I'm just going to punch him in the testicles, okay? Ooh. And uh, next thing I'm going to gouge his eyeballs. Oh no, I lost it there. No, you're that good. wasn't right. If, if wasn't I would right. close my eyes and I would hear that, probably I'd be like, oh yeah, that is Ian. <laughs> Practical ka'a bunkai. <laughs> yeah. That is good. It's not bad, right? <laughs> it's great. Yeah, he uh, he actually commented on uh, on our podcast once, um, yes, saying that it was <laughs> the, the accent was, was not ter- quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. What? Yeah. What happened? What um, was it? I, I did I did him during the podcast, and I I tagged him in it then to see if we could get him to comment, and he did, and he was like, uh, "You don't quite sound right, but not a bad." Uh, uh, he said what I said was I t- I was just talking about punching the testicles and gouging the eyeballs, <laughs> and he said spot on advice, you know, when it came to bunkai. And stuff, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but not quite the accent wasn't quite there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you should um Rokas you you're two weeks less than left in Dublin. Actually even less no. in a way. I mean I'm I, I will be I will be leaving Dublin uh indefinitely in two weeks. But because of my injury uh, I can't train, so I'm going actually to Leeds on Wednesday for a week. Mm-hmm. So I'll be here for a few days. Uh, go to England, so come back, do some filming and then are you out of action for like for a good while now? It's hard to say, but mm. tell me what was on your I was going to say you should come down and train. I would like to. Yeah. Actually, that was yeah. on my mind. Even even before a week before when we connected, I was thinking about that, and I was hoping my ankle will be better by the time I'll be back. 
and I was thinking maybe to ask like, oh, can I do a training session before I? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> On Fridays, we normally hit the pads before the pod, before uh, the kids mm. class and then we do the podcast afterwards. Mm. So yeah. it's really informal, no doggies, just uh, mm. it's basically like a kickboxing session. It's, it's just, you it's know, a it's a session with cr- pads. Cr- <laughs> uh, one of the... We we talk about this all the time pod, on the podcast, so it's probably boring the listeners to death. But we talk I'll edit about, this out, don't worry. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> but we talk we talk about how you know the the, be, the one of the biggest strengths in karate is the amount of kihon that we do because yeah. it trains our body, we coordination of everything. Like that, but it's also the biggest weakness because we never actually put it to the test yeah. enough. And and we're and what's good is Scott Sensi like he's very aware of that and he and he tries to to get rid of the misconceptions in karate as much as we can and he's installed it in us who teach for him and stuff. So I started bringing people here on Fridays when there's no class on and just said let's just get you know the big gloves on, shin pads, mouth guards in and just you know and let just just. No rules, just you know. Obviously, like, you know, <laughs> no rules. No rules. No rules. Just like Kai <laughs> yeah, Just like you know. Obviously, nothing stupid. But let's just you know spar yeah. like for like a little bit more realism and and see how well the techniques hold up. You know, under that pressure, the same sort of thing you're doing, but to a much much lesser extent. <laughs> no, but but I feel that's that's a really good approach because and I think it doesn't even have to be done much, but just. For me, that was the, the kind of shocker. Uh, if, if there's a bit of misconception on how I approached the initial Aikido versus MMA video. Some people believe that I went there expecting my Aikido to work, and that wasn't the case. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. knew that it'll fail, and it'll fail drastically, but dramatically, but then I, I, I didn't expect it to be... It was like, I expected it to be bad. It was even worse. Yeah. <laughs> right. But then uh, the worst part was I didn't expect myself to flinch that bad. Mm. And uh, that's a big you thing. Need to get, you need to get used to getting hit. Like, I think traditional mm-hmm. martial arts focus so much on. And cry anyway. People block. Right. And it's like as soon as somebody punches you and you move here, you're hit. There. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's one of those things. Like, you know, as, as soon as you have that free flow of movement and it's not set attacks and stuff, it's very, like very tricky not to flinch. Yeah. Right. Keep so, your yeah. composure, you know. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Well, if you can, if you think your ankle will hold up, yeah. you should come on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Come on a Tuesday or a Thursday, because when be... is a Tuesday? Like a seven Tuesday. p.m. Yeah. Seven yeah. p.m. on a Tuesday or a Thursday. What can I expect from that? Like... <laughs> <Just a> great <laughs> class. Yeah, great class. Yeah, yeah, Ross I, teaches I, on Tuesdays and Scott teaches on Thursdays. Mondays yeah. is black and brown belts only. So. Um, Not there, but you yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but what's what's the curriculum on Tuesday like? Like it, it just depends on my mood really. <laughs> I can teach whatever. Like <laughs> it, it, like it's not like I say. Wednesday's the Wednesday's the only class where the, there's two hours two hours on a Tuesday night two hours on Wednesday night. The second hour on the Wednesday is sort of karate sparring like and it's training for karate tournaments competitions. So that we we train to the rules of karate. Hmm. Um, so that's the only class that's like set. Other than that, we're allowed the freedom to teach whatever we want, um, and it just depends on the mood. Like, and, and it depends who's in. Sometimes you'll have, because it's mixed. We don't keep it like again. Instructors train in the morning is for the invites only. You get some high level guys who are, are invited in who are you know, dang grades black belts, um, but most of the time it's just instructors and one or two other guys. Whereas the class in the evening, apart from Scott Sensi's class on the Monday. It's open to everyone, so any adult can come along, and uh, we have to just adjust the class to whoever's there. So it just depends. But yeah, come along, and it, what like what it tends to be is we'll do certain karate techniques, drills and stuff. We won't really touch self defense or anything like that in a big way because again, it's not what we do. We're doing a martial. We're doing karate. It's it's so we teach karate. That's but it. we have quite we have quite a strong emphasis on biomechanics here and. Mm. We have a scientific approach. I think you'd appreciate it. So you should come down and train. Generating power, how to move fluidly, like and how to, like explaining them, like because one of the big things is karate techniques. Again, it's taught they, don't work. they don't work <laughs> much. Like, but it's it's how like what is the principle behind punching in a long stance? Like why why do we do that? Yeah. Why do we move our hips the way that we move it? Why is there such yeah. emphasis on hip movement? Why is there such emphasis on punching square on rather than twisting into it? Why do we punch straight instead of punching round? And it's just like that kind of putting restraints on your body in order to develop connections, muscular connections, and then being able to then freely move through it and still have that connection mm-hmm. ingrained. Which I think for me has made a big difference because when I do do like we get the pads out, we do do hooks and stuff, without practicing it, it's still very powerful. We still sort of, te- we test our punches, kicks, everything, like all the techniques a lot, 
um, to make sure that they work because that's the most important thing. Yeah, you've got to make it work in a certain way, and that's what we kind of emphasise on in classes. But we try to teach it through the system of Shotokan karate, um, which is just a beautiful art, really. You know, that's, that's the thing. Like another part of it, like you can be practical if you want. I think another big part of it is, like I've done MMA, I've done jujitsu, I've done. Mm -hmm. Thai boxing, but karate is the thing I love. I love the structure of it. I love the katas. I love the the competition aspect of karate. Um, it's something that I love to do. Mm. Um, and if I can make, I can, if I can justify that training and make it work, then that's great. Yeah, I, I like what you say, and and there's um, and I see two sides to it, and, and I think I had that conversation with Ian Abernethy as well. Uh, that you're doing, we're doing martial arts for years upon years and hundreds of hours. And if we would be doing that just to protect ourselves one in that one instance in life, if we ever get that, it's crazy. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. make sense. You know, it doesn't it's make sense. It's a lunatic right. <laughs> <laughs> mindset, right? right? Yeah. It doesn't make sense to do martial arts for that reason. Uh, what, I, what I learned about self-defense when practicing it, it's, and it, the idea also comes from uh, Tony Blower, the founder of Spear, where he said that uh, self-defense, or the, the way he taught, teaches self-defense, it's like the um, first aid kit, or like the, um, I don't know how you call it in English, when you you know, you know see in movies when somebody dies and you shock CPR? them. CPR? Oh, or uh, CPR, the uh, or, defibrillator. Or like, yeah, yeah or like a CPR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't need much time to learn that, and it's not going to make you a doctor, but it can save someone's life. Right. And a lot of self-defense is about that. You just go for a course, like a solid course, Weekend, a week, you learn the basics of the psychology of the the dynamics of the body dynamics, and that's that'll sorry that'll make you so much safer in everyday life. But then martial arts is a different realm, and you don't need to. It's interrelated, but you don't need to ex invest all of that time just to defend yourself. You, you do it because you like it. And, uh, and again, I think Ian said that specifically. He said, "I do karate first primarily because I, I like it." And then he also explores the bunkai because it's an important subject. But it's like self for him, karate is not all about self defense. Primarily, it's like it makes me feel good. It's it's a good way of spending it's time. A, it's, it's a beautiful thing to do. And just, exactly. It's like why not? Yeah, in your life, yeah. Right. And I think do 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 you looking back find this? Do you find that love with with aikido? Do you think that as much as it's not maybe applicable in self defense, the way that some other martial arts would be or the MMA or anything like that, do you still find like you just in, like sometimes do you ever find if you are talking to somebody or meet up with someone who does Aikido you just enjoy doing the techniques you just enjoy having that connection with someone and going back and forth do you ever find that? For me it's a tough question because uh, as much as I would like to be more positive about it I also feel like I have did it for so so long, I guess it's not the right word to say, but at the same time, I did like a lot of it. Like through those years that I did, like as Nuchideshi, I trained like three to three to four times per day, and then as an instructor, I was teaching like every day, and so so it became there was so so much I, that went into it, and also now as I look back, there's so many negative things that I ignored that it's again difficult to not throw the baby water the baby with the, with the bath water. Uh, so my personal experience as it is now, I'm not necessarily feeling like I would really want to go on the mat and do, I thought about it, like, ah, oh, maybe I should go do an Aikido class, see how it feels. But part of me is quite sure that my mind will be like, oh my God, what am I doing here? I've That's like going back to your ex, man. Like I guess so. Out. I guess so. And I hate to say that because <laughs> I, I, which I don't like think is a bad thing. Else, but... <laughs> <laughs> We, we, did back. we have a conversation about that before? What go, go. about like breakup sex? No, <laughs> I've got a, I've know. got a hot take on break breakup sex, no, but it's probably not a good topic for the podcast. Oh, I want to know. <laughs> I think breakup sex is a thing. I think uh, um, <laughs> what is a thing? I think, I think that um, my current girlfriend listens to this, and I'm not <laughs> going to talk about this subject. Tell me and then delete it. <laughs> <laughs> so you should edit know. this part. <laughs> She's coming over next week, man. <laughs> well, I didn't say you didn't say anything. You're yeah, grand. Yeah, fine. fine. <laughs> tell me. You have to tell me, and then no, you can no. delete this. Well, no. Let's just talk no. about Aikido. Oh, <laughs> it's it good to a... get that hit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying it's a great way to get closure. <laughs> I got closure, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, but I, I think that, like, for example, um, I don't know. Like, I would, I would think that, like, again. 
right now you're in that stage where ah, oh, Akira's dead to me. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like it's very much like I'm done with it. I've spent so much yeah. time, and I don't know if you feel like nihilistic about it and that you wasted your time. Do you think you wasted your time with Akira? Do you think it was just a ah, it's uh, that was such a waste, da, da, da. or do you think that it's like you say you got some positive aspects out of it and you still try and talk about the positive aspects? Do you think you have to force yourself to find that, or do you think you see them black and white like? Oh, there's positives and there's negatives, yeah. and that's just the way it is. Well, you're correct that I'm I'm still in the stage where it's I'm I'm bitter about it, so it's difficult for me to again separate the the good and the bad. But um, I I I can admit that if it wasn't for Aikido, I wouldn't be who I am right now. Man, Maybe. he's talking about his ex-girlfriend. This is the kind of stuff you say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but yeah, it's it it gave me things and tools which without I wouldn't be where I am. Uh, maybe I've did it for too long. Maybe I hung around for too long. But at the same time, again, if it wasn't for that, like that's if I would be upset about something, that that would be something that I could justify and be like, oh my gosh, like 13, 14 years. You know, uh, maybe ten would have been enough. Maybe eight would have been enough. But at the same time, again, it it put the whole situation put me in a situation which is unique. Yeah. Uh, when I look back and I realize, when I look back at the, at the main video that I did, the Aikido versus MMA, that was I didn't realize at the time, but now it was such a unique moment because I did not practice MMA at all before. I did some jujitsu, but even still not that much. And if I would have filmed that video a couple of years later and trained in the May before, it wouldn't have been as a clear for, example, yeah, right, yeah. Of, of what that is. And the story wouldn't have been documented. So, so in a way, it's, it all went, it, it, it does have that sense of this is how it was supposed to happen. On the ego level, yes, part of me is upset about maybe I've stuck, stuck around for too long, but I can't also... I can't blame that either. I mean, I can't be upset about that too much. It's just part of the journey, right? Exactly. That's it, yeah. Guys, it's that time. It's the time main, the main subject. Time to, time to talk about the fails of the week. Fails of the week. Will I go first? Go on then. Because I got one. Um, okay. It's my arm. What's wrong with your arm, man? So... Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Basically, my arm looks like I'm becoming a zombie. Three quarters of my arm is covered by a, the biggest <laughs> bruise I have ever seen. Definitely the biggest bruise I've ever had. I was sparring last Friday during our, our heavy session that we do with the gloves on and yada yada that we always talk about. And I was, uh, my brother is a kickboxer, so he and I were sparring and I went in for a body shot with the right hand and at the same time he lifted his knee uh, for, I don't know, for a kick or maybe he thought I was going in for a kick because he wanted to check it. And his knee, cr- like, and my bicep just crashed together with the force of my body weight and his body weight going in at the same time and I'm pretty sure my bicep is ripped but it took I was the arm was swollen up for three days and it took those three days for the bruise to actually come up and it's just there's just so much blood inside there look at that on the upside though your arm looks great man you're swole as fuck look at the look at that bicep My bicep your right is hand like is double the size. Right arm, <laughs> double the size of your left leg. Like. <laughs> it looks pretty great, man. If it wasn't all purple and green, it would look really good. Let's get some foundation on that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, I've been out of training since Tuesday because my arm has just been too fucking sore, and I feel debilitated. Wasn't even able Let's to sleep. Massage out. Come on. No, man, stop. <sighs> uh, no, higher. Higher up here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ah, there it is. Can you feel that? Oh, it's like, ooh. It's really hard, isn't it? feels it? like cartilage, man. That's disgusting. I'm pretty sure the bicep is ripped there. Ooh, yeah, it feels bad, yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what was I saying? It's bad, yeah. It's, but yeah, I, have, I wasn't able to sleep the first two or three nights because it was just yeah. too sore. So there's my fail. That's, that's a fail, yeah. Don't, don't try and... Protect punch. your biceps, folks. Don't punch people anymore, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a feel, yes. Um, so last week, there on Thursday, there was a some, one of the kids in the the first class that I do, which is the four four o'clock class on the, on the Thursday. The little kids, beginners, white belts to orange belts, sort of thing. Like you know, just starting out, little titchies. And one of them left bleach all over the floor. Yeah. They they went into the toilet. They went to the toilet. 
and I don't know which one it was because you know during that class you know three mm-hmm. four maybe go to the toilet and one of them emptied bleach all over the floor okay kids are kids is something that they do I said guys one of you's done that don't do it again I don't want to know who it was I don't want any confessions don't do it again this week shaving foam all over the floor like like some the same kid the same class I saw that same kid yeah, yeah, shaving yeah. foam oh, there's a shaving foam in there now no, but I remember when there oh, was. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like last week, yeah. But so. like, yeah, yeah. So shame foam all over the floor. Uh, so I got a little bit annoyed and went and had, had a rant at the kids. I sat them down and I said, "Listen, it's out of order." Like, I started to get. I was already pissed off that day, but I was like, you know, if I if any, I don't again. Don't tell me who you are, but listen, if I catch any of you doing it, if it happens again next week, I don't care. You can piss outside. <laughs> You'll be banned from going to the toilet. Don't know, don't know. Later on in that class, one of the kids said, like, can I go to the toilet? And he looked quite sad. And I was like, yeah, she, yeah, yeah, you can go to the toilet. And he goes, and he heads, and he heads outside. And I was like, no, 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 you don't have to go outside. Just snip it. So leave happens again. Please be face. He was like, I'm going to go pee outside. <laughs> so, yeah, I was, oh, no, you can go to the toilet. So that was, that was a fail to, to maybe... Tell the kids that if they do it again, they can, they can piss outside. That you made the kids think they had to piss outside. Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. <gasps> so, yeah. <laughs> Rokas, your turn. Rokas, go on. It has to be last week, right? This ah, year. No, 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 you no, can come on. Do this, like, Fairly, this well, is your one. It, it was last week, yeah. It was, it was this week. It was <laughs> the, pretend the it was the week. this week. I, I could give a couple, like, last week, but there is, like, if I think, like, what's the biggest fail i really felt bad about in the past few weeks do it for the listeners man okay i'll do it for (laughs) listeners so the first couple months that i arrived or month and a half that i arrived to uh dublin john kavanaugh was kind enough to let me live at his place and uh uh yeah (laughs) yeah, anyway so yeah (laughs) yeah it was was a big fail for me uh and uh, i had where did i go i had a trip I think I went to Lithuania or whatever, I don't remember, but I went somewhere, I had a flight in the morning and I was very tired and I brought a lot of food because I was training a lot and I was eating a lot because I wanted to gain weight. I brought a lot of food to my room and I ate a lot and I then left like a mess, like a lot of <laughs> different food leftovers. Didn't look good. But then I was like, oh yeah, I'm just going to clean up when I'll get back. And I go away and a couple of days later, I get a message from John Kavanaugh a video <laughs> of the table full of, you know, stuff that I left with an emoji of holding hands like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I felt so bad. <laughs> I can't describe to you how ashamed I felt. And I thought, actually, before I left, I thought, like, maybe I should clean it up before I go. But I was like, no one is going to go into my room. No one is going <laughs> to check it out. I'll just come back and clean it then. And it was a huge embarrassment. So oh that was definitely God. a feel. That's the book you Damn, really yeah. yeah. So much for being <laughs> a good guest. Like, letting down sensei. Being yeah, just exactly, just exactly. That's, and that's, you know, that's the thing is when you let down someone, it's like, yeah, you know, it can survive. But when it's someone you're like, who's your coach or, or yeah, sensei, you're like, oh my God, yeah, that so much more respect for and, and dependence on. Oh. Yeah. So that was Yikes. Good. I'm yeah. cringing. Shame on you. Man. Shame on you. <laughs> well, at least I'm letting it all out. Yeah. <laughs> Therapy. It'll all come out therapy <laughs> all right we better say goodbye my mother's yeah. calling me i have to go he's he's you've been very good Roger. that was a long long chat so yeah. thank, thank you very much for thank fun. you very much for calling the podcast hope you enjoyed it we certainly did that was, yeah that exactly. was great and uh yeah man stay in touch come in and train uh enjoy the rest of your time in dublin enjoy yourself in england i give 90 percent that will come down to train as long as my yes come down fantastic train. yeah yes yeah. would be I'll, i would make a video about it will be called my first karate class. Yes, <laughs> we'll be famous. <laughs> yes. Just don't, famous. just just don't score this too bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is why karate's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> or in fact, if you're going to do it, do it that bad. Like if you're going to score this, don't yeah, be, yeah. don't go give us like, in. oh, I no, suppose in this, just go all in, call us all the ball bags, like call us all the bad names. <laughs> Say, what is this guy doing? Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a punch. <laughs> no, actually, go, go. with people I know, I always um, I never say bad things about people I know. So. <laughs> well, uh, well, if you do, hopefully you'll enjoy it. But thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it.
Awesome. Sacrifice your time. Very Deep good. bows and horses. Horse, awesome, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Horse. Awesome.